in vain. Even the smallest efforts sometimes are better than nothing. Come on now. Uh, anybody ever got up to sing or preach and you just felt like you didn't do as well? You didn't feel like you did that good? Anybody ever done that before? I can tell you tonight that even the smallest efforts are better than no efforts at all. So don't ever quit. Don't ever back up. You let the Lord help you. And you just keep marching forward in Christ. Amen. And as Brother Smith says, good to have these folks with us tonight. We're just going to try to obey God tonight. Let the Lord have His way. What do you say? If you will, get your Bibles tonight. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. The book of Acts, chapter number 1. And uh, we're going to start reading there. We're going to read over into chapter number 2. Praise the Lord. Hey Amen. Once you get it, stand to your feet. Acts chapter number 1. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize to you for much reading. I don't normally read this much, but um, I'm just going to obey God tonight. I'm just going to do what he would have me to do. And then we're going to read into verse chapter number 2. And as far as the Spirit of the Lord would lead us to tonight. And uh, here's what the Bible said, for those of you ready. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount of, called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Did you hear that? Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zel Zelots, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about a hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained a part of his ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as the field is called in the proper tongue, El Kadema, this is to say the field of blood. 
For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have complain, are com accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. And the Bible said, Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? And they appointed Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias, they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. For those of you wondering what's happening here in the Scripture, you understand that Judas fell. Judas was the one that sold the Lord out for just a few pieces of silver. Now they're trying to figure out who's going to fill his shoes. They cast lots, if you will, and it landed upon Matthias. Chapter number 2, we're going to read a few verses here. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jew Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now this was noised abroad. The multitude came together and they and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own, own language and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Perithians, Medes, Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judah, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya, Cyrene and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes, Arabians, do we hear them speak in our own, own tongues the wonderful works of God? The Bible said, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking, saying, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be known this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing as but the, eleven, the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Apologize for much reading tonight, but I wanted you to be able to hear the whole entire story so I don't have to spend the whole entire message tonight preaching it all out. Most of you followed along. But I'd like to preach or talk to you tonight about a thought that the Holy Ghost laid upon my heart, and that is a decision must be made at all of it. A decision must be made at all of it. Would you stretch your hand tonight to the Lord and pray for the will of God. Father, we love you tonight. We appreciate the good words that you have shared with us through the Bible tonight, God, through the Scripture. We pray tonight, God, that you'll speak to every heart in life, God, of how that we can get closer to you, God, that we can draw near to the Spirit of God. We praise you, God, for what you do in this service, for the anointing that you put upon us. I pray, God, that you'll lay a heavy anointing upon me tonight to share the very thoughts and the very intents of God tonight with this congregation, and we'll be careful to praise you for all that you do. And all of God's people can say amen. If you will, shake two people's hand tonight. Tell them a decision must be made at all of it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to do a little teach preaching tonight with the help of the Lord. As we look back at the book of Acts, we understand tonight that this is a continuation. The apostle uh, Paul is not the writer of the book of Acts. The apostle Paul may be deemed as a man of power and anointing and so forth, but it was not Paul that wrote this powerful book that has been deemed the Acts of the Apostles, but it was the writer by the name of Luke, St. Luke. He's the one that began to pin down these words that some call the Acts of Apostles. It's also been called the Transactions of the, the Apostles, 
And uh, when you look at this book, others have even deemed this the book of the Holy Ghost. In other words, when the Spirit of God was poured out, now I want to talk to you for a moment about Pentecost for those of you that don't understand the relevance and the importance and the significance behind Pentecost. If you go back and you study history, you'll understand that the days of Pentecost were the days of harvest. You understand that during this period of time before it was ever a spiritual significance, it had a physical significance. So whenever they said the days of Pentecost, they would mark these as the days of harvesting. So whenever Pentecost was to be implemented, it, it meant they were going to go out into the fields and they were going to begin to reap the harvest. So it was no coincidence that God used the days of Pentecost to mark a spiritual time of harvesting. So to me, I don't know about you, but to me that blesses me to know that God didn't just use any old time to, to implement his uh, going forth and reaping Reaching the harvest of the lost people. But he used the times of Pentecost. And so this physical time that would be the uh, implementing of a physical harvest, God would turn it around to use it as a spiritual harvesting of souls. So this was not just any fly by night time that God used, I mean, for the church. So what I want us to see tonight is how that God used this. Amen. When I look at the book of Acts, I understand that. God was about to launch the church forth into a spiritual time of reaching, of preaching, of trying to disciple, to get those that were lost to come on board. And so God needed to have a group of people, a church that he could use, that he could infill, that he could empower, and to help them to overcome. Now there's three things here that takes place that I want you to see that God did. Number one, he empowered them. Number two, he gave them a vision. And number three, not only that, but he gave them purpose. You see, all three of these things that had to take place in the book of Acts, I want to tell you tonight, as sadly as I have to report to you as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, these three things are missing from many of our churches today. Power, purpose, and vision. I want you to know that we as a people, we need to make our mind up what we really want from the Lord, what we want to see God do in this last day and hour. You see, God has not called us to be a bunch of spoiled children who have blessed me, tickled me, pat me, rub me with some oil, but God has called a church to rise up and be a mighty army for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. If I can get through this tonight, I've, I've got a cold on the way home. And anything else you can imagine that the enemy would throw at you to try to keep you distracted. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with the help of the Lord so you just bear in here with me tonight. What I look at in the scripture is this. There was a time that Jesus appears in the Bible called it, uh, Luke's words, by many infallible proofs. In other words, the Lord showed up after his ascension, after his death, he showed up and showed himself to the disciples and many other people. You see, it wasn't just the words or some story in a storybook that people could say, well, the Lord ascended into heaven and he showed himself to two or three people. That ain't what happened. When the Lord showed himself, he showed himself to several different people. And in the setting that we read at, uh, in, in Luke's words in Acts chapter number one, I picture in my mind, I don't know if they were standing or sitting, but I picture them sitting in a room with the Lord who was supposed to have been crucified. They saw him dead. They saw him crucified, but he sits in a room with them. Can you imagine what a, a spiritual moment moment that that must have been. He's got a room full of people and he's talking to them about the good things of God, about the commission, about the call. He's talking to them about many different things. I would have loved to have been there and heard what he said and how did he encourage or challenge them to go forth and reach the harvest. And you see, right in the midst of this, the Lord begins to tell them there's something that I want you to do. You need to go down to Jerusalem. You're going to have to go down there and you're going to tarry until you be endued with power from on high. When I think about this, I think 
about somebody who is going to empower the army. It's almost as if the captain of the general says, I want you to go out to the battlefield, but before you go to the battlefield, I want you to stop by, amen, where the, where the weapons are, and I want you to pick you up an AK-7. I want you to pick you up a machine gun. I want you to go over to the storehouse, and I want you to get everything you need. Get your bulletproof vest while you're there. You know, get all of these things. You see, to the child of God, we understand that to be the armor that God tells us to put on. He said, put on the full armor of God. But even greater than that, he was going to empower them. He was going to give them something greater than they understood or had experienced at that point. The Bible tells us that they were going to be endued with power. That word power in its original uh, meaning was deutimus. The word deutimus simply means dynamite. Come on. Amen. Like a stick of dynamite. And I tell you, God's church should be like a stick of dynamite. A lot of times we're like a stick of dynamite who's got a dead fuse, who's got a dead wick. Come on, somebody. But I believe that God's church, when it's filled with the Holy Ghost, is a church like dynamite, a church with power, a church that has been filled, a church that has been equipped, a church that has been sent and has a commission and straight from God. Can you say amen, somebody? So when we look at God as he gets ready to send them to Jerusalem, you've got a group of people sitting around trying to make him in to listen to what he says. And when God says, I want you to go and tarry in Jerusalem and don't leave. Go back and read it for yourself. Don't leave. In other words, you stay until you get what I told you you were going to get. Because if you're going to do my work, you first got to go by Jerusalem. I don't read where he said go to the upper room. I read where he said go to Jerusalem and tarry. When they got there, they ended up in an upper room. And when they got there, they began to pray. But what I want to talk to you about for just a few moments tonight is not the fact that they prayed in Jerusalem, not just yet. But what I want to talk to you about is what took place over at Olivet before they ever made that trip. You see, when we read the story, you see the Bible tells us a Sabbath day's journey. On the Sabbath, they can only travel but so far. When I first read it, I thought, well, maybe it was 30 or 40 miles. Somebody in one place I read said, it could have been this, could have been that, but a seventh Sabbath day's journey was about a half to a mile long trip. And so, here's what, you got a group of people sitting around, and the Lord says, I want you to leave this place, go about a half to a mile away from here, and I want you to find yourself a place, and don't you leave until you get in fear with the power that come from on high. You know, when I got thinking about this story, uh, something came to my mind. Some of y'all remember the times here at Grace Street where we've got together and we have class in the back. Anybody been here when we've had class in the back? What always, uh, what, what kind of blew my mind a few times, I'll put it this way, is that we have people came in, sit during the song service, and then whenever it was time to dismiss to go to the back, to study the word of God and to get what they really needed, they left. Anybody ever remember people doing that? <laughs> Y'all don't laugh too much now. I'm not preaching at anybody, so if, that, if it was you that left, I don't know. And if you had to go home because you got sick or whatever, I understand. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But I'm talking about people that just, you know, it's like we stayed for the per first part of the service where we got, where we feel good, you know, you sang us into a holy oblivion and we're good for another two months, we'll see you two months from now kind of stuff, right? And, and so we dismiss to go back to the back so we can get into the word of God and people leave. You know, I got to looking at this and I wondered to myself, while they're there at Olivet, and this is where I got my title from, a decision has to be made at Olivet before you're gonna go over, amen, to Jerusalem and make a decision whether you're going to go over there and pray. Folks, let me explain something to you. A decision has to be made whether you're going to, you're willing to make the half or mile trip. A decision has to be made if you're going to go and stay. I want you to know something. When you go talking about commitment and you go talking about work and labor, a lot of times people like adios. 
Come on. I don't want no part of that. Come on, somebody. So the Lord let them know. You know, let me let me preach this this way. I went down to Jamaica in 2007. Brother Steve, he, he's here. He was there when I was down there. We went together on a mission trip, and he can appreciate this. I saw one of the craziest things I ever saw when I was down there. First of all, I'll tell you this. Those folks are out worship some of us dead people two to ten to one. Come on. Hey, man, everything they do, they move and they sing. They worship. I'd love to see some people get in. Hey, man, I want you to know something, folks. God never intended a church to be a dead body. It's alive because he's alive evermore. But while I was down there, I saw something that just blew my mind. I thought that's the craziest thing I ever saw. And then we had about four or five hundred people one night in a church service, and then the preacher got up and preached, and he turned it over to the pastor, which was customary, so they said. And so the pastor took the mic, and he stood up on the platform, and he said, How many of you tonight want to serve the Lord? Raise your hand. Man, I'm telling you, you look like half the church raised a hand. Stand to your feet if you want to serve God. Stand to your feet. So it looked like half the church stood up. They were getting ready to give their heart to God, to get saved. Man, everything's looking good. Man, it's looking pretty good, Brother Billy. Got a lot of folks going to give their heart to the Lord. So the pastor said, okay, for all of you that want to serve God, I want you to walk up to the front of the church and just stand right around here. It looked like, again, about half or a little less than half the church came and stood all up around the platform. Me and Brother Steve talked about it. It's the craziest thing in the world. I'm telling you, I guess there's pros and cons with everything, but I saw something strange that night. They all stood around the altar and all up around the front. But they, and so the pastor said, okay, now, for those of you that really, really, really want to serve God, I want you to step up on the platform. Now, out of about half the church that got up, walked to the front, about 13 people stepped up on the platform. I'm thinking to myself the same thing some of y'all are thinking. Why would you even waste your time? Why stand up? Why go to the front if you're not going to go all the way? Is anybody else feeling what I'm feeling? Why would you waste your time? Folks, I look at the church today and I wonder sometimes uh, why people waste their time to come to the house of God if they're not good enough having to raise their hand and give God praise. I wonder why. Come on, why you go to the altar and not really pray? Listen, this ain't about obligation. This ain't about going for the motions. It's about feeling the power. It's about being called and equipped to do the work God called us to do. A decision has got to be made in all of it. And that decision is, am I going to go all the way? I wonder. You see, I got to thinking about this tonight. You know, the Lord could have very easily said, all right, lift your hands. I'm going to pour it on you right now, right now. He could have done that because he's God. If he can make a donkey talk, folks, he can do that, can he? Why did he do it the way he did? I can't promise you that I know exactly. But folks, he gave them fair warning what they had to do. Sometimes I wonder if God gives us an opportunity to separate the wheat from the chaff before that we ever make it to the day of judgment. I heard a preacher say one time that we're living in days and times today when it's almost popular to say you're a Christian and people live like the devil. Come on now. Amen. But he said there's coming a time, amen, in this world that we live in when we're going to see who's in this thing for the fishes and the loaves and who's in it for Christ. Come on now. I didn't get in this thing for the fishes and loaves. I didn't get in this thing to see what the church could give me. I didn't get in this to see, amen, if the singing was just right, if the preaching made me feel right. I got in this because I love the Lord Jesus Christ and a decision's got to be made. Are you going to go all the way or what are you going to do? Amen. A question could be asked to some of us tonight. You see, amen, I go back to some of the times in my ministry and I can tell you that in one particular church I pastored, I've testified of this before, but almost everybody in that church claimed they wanted to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. For an entire year, I preached the Holy Ghost everywhere you can preach the Holy Ghost. I preach 
from Genesis to Revelation. Everything you could think of that had to pertain to the Holy Ghost, I preached it. I'd get up preaching entire messages about needing to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and people just sit there. Praise God. Oh, that's some fine preaching you did tonight. Amen. And at the end of the year, you know what would disturb me as a pastor and it'll make you feel like you're not doing your job? Amen. Every month I fill out a monthly report. Uh, how many people got saved? How many got sanctified? How many got filled with the Holy Ghost? Uh, and after a whole entire year of preaching the gospel, at the very end of the year, I had to see it come back to my house. Uh, and not one person got filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, you see, what we say with our mouth uh, is totally something different uh, than what we do when we go to the altar and we pray, God, help me. It bothers me that people like that church there in Jamaica did. Amen. Yes, I want it. But they go so far. And then when God says, okay, it's time. Amen. It's time to make a decision. And all of it, are you ready to go on past here? I brought you this far. I saved you. I helped you. You received the sacrifice that I gave not too long ago on the cross. You see, Christ had already died. He showed up. Amen. Someone might have thought he was a ghost. Him and Thomas said, I won't believe it until I stick my hands in his wounds. Let Christ showed himself. And now that the Lord is in front of them, he says, now, I brought you this far. Are you ready to go the next step? As a pastor, I'm asking some of you, are you ready to go to the next step? Hey, Amen, I'm afraid that some people get satisfied to stay in all of that. And I tell you, I'm not satisfied with all of that. I've already experienced how good God is. And this ain't all there is to this thing. I'm here to tell you, amen, I've preached this a lot here lately in other churches. I preached two revivals in the last couple months and I'm gonna tell you something, I've been saying this to other places. You're looking at somebody that knows how to have church, somebody that's been in some powerful services. I've been in some services whether you didn't know whether to run, jump, run a pew, run an aisle, you didn't know whether to pray, stand still, crawl on the floor, as the power of God was so thick. Amen, I know what it feels like to be in an atmosphere like that. Why should I settle for all of that when God said go to Jerusalem? Are we, got, we got some hungry people that say God help us as a church. You got to make up your mind what you want to do. Huh? I had a brother one time in a church where that we were attending. He said he wanted the Holy Ghost but he made a statement. He said when I get the Holy Ghost he said, all that flipping and flopping and jumping and hopping. He said, ain't no sense in all that. He said, when I get the Holy Ghost, I'm not going to act like that. <laughs> Sister Tammy knows who I'm talking about. Amen. He said, I'm not going to do any of that. Yeah, all right. Be careful what you say you ain't going to do. Because the Holy Ghost has got, I think, he, I think God's got a good sense of humor. I really do. And... Uh, He's going to do what he wants to do. And if you ain't willing to let him, then you ain't going to receive him. Come on. And so I watched that night. We prayed for that brother. He'd be stiff as a board. Lord, help me, Jesus. God, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Lord, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And you know what happened to him? He finally got so tired of not receiving the Holy Ghost because he, uh, he was being stubborn about what he, how he was going to do it and what he was going to do and all that. And he finally took the brakes off and he said, God, you know what he did? He had to make a spiritual decision in all of that that said, you know what? I'm ready to go to the upper room. I'm ready to go to Jerusalem. I'm ready to go all the way. I watched him. And one night I was praying with him around the altar and I said to him, I said, son, I said, listen, you're going to have to yield to the Lord. I said, the same way clay is pliable in the hand of the potter. I said, if you're stiff and hard and unpliable and you won't let God do whatever he wants to do, I said, God ain't gonna mold you like he wants to mold you. He can't make you what he wants to make you unless you say, God, take my life. If you wanna empty me out, if you wanna turn me upside down, whatever you wanna do, God, that's what I want. 
And you know what happened? I watched him one night when he finally took off the brakes and he let God begin to move. You see, some people, they're too dignified to, to shout, too dignified to get happy. They're worried somebody might think. You see, we didn't have Facebook back then. For today, folks are worried. I have people all the time tell me, oh, y'all, did y'all broadcast that service on, on the internet? I'm not, if I, if I ever shout, if I ever shout, I'm going to the back of the church. Hey, man, I don't want the whole world. Come on now. You know, even baptism, wow, Lord, help me. Water baptism in itself is a public profession of what the power of God did in your life. It's an example of everything Christ did in the spirit. And I tell you, I'm not ashamed of what I do. I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm not ashamed that I made a decision to leave all of that and go to Jerusalem. I'm not ashamed of what God did. I ain't ashamed. Can you say amen? But you gotta make a decision. I watched Brother Steve as the power of God hit him. He flipped over the back of that altar. He jerked and flopped like a fish out of water and all me and the pastor could do. I'm telling you, we was trying to pray with him and trying to laugh at the same time. We wasn't making fun of him, but you know what it was? I got tickled because I thought all I could hear him say is when I get the Holy Ghost, I ain't shouting like that. But you see what he did, Sister Tammy? He made up his mind. He said, I'm tired of standing here. I'm tired of going home without it. I'm tired of leaving here without what God sent me after. Let me tell you folks, even there's some of you, you've already got it made up in your mind. God can't do it. God can't touch you. Let me tell you something, Curtis, son, you can do, You can be used of God just as much if not more than me because you're still young. I didn't get this thing till I was in my late 20s. What if God got on you? You might be the world's greatest next evangelist. You can't count God out. What God's waiting on is you to make a decision in all of that. You don't never know what God's about to do. Brother Caleb, God may marry, get you guys married. Next thing you know, years down the road, you might be pastoring some church and making an impact on somebody's life. But you gotta make a decision in all of that. And you say, we're going all the way. We didn't get in this thing to go part of the way. How many says, I'm going all the way? I'm here to tell us tonight that it's your job and it's my job to make that decision. Huh? You see, as a pastor, I can encourage you and tell you and I can try to lead you, but ultimately, it's up to you. Whenever the band strikes out and we're headed to Jerusalem, you're either gonna go or you're not gonna go. One of the two. I want you to stop for imagine. I want you to imagine what it was like because it was probably a lot like it is around our day. Imagine the conversation where the Lord wants us to go on up to Jerusalem. It ain't but a half a mile. Yeah, but I'm tired, man. I'm real tired. I mean, I'm wore out. And uh, I got some things I got to do tomorrow. I got to get up early in the morning. Man, you don't understand. I got to get up early in the morning. I got things to do. Huh? Am I preaching still? Well, I want you to get up. I want you to make a decision. Get up and follow the rest of the church. And you get a handful of people says, come on, man. It'll be all right. Come on, we're gonna go. We're gonna go on over to Jerusalem. We're gonna see God move. We're gonna see God bless. And you got a couple of people says, well, even though I, I, I'm so busy right now, and uh, you know, a thousand different excuses of why, or maybe they're bored to death. Maybe, well, I'm just bored out of my mind, and uh, I don't care what it seems like. You go to Olive, you leave Olive, and you head to Jerusalem. You find you in upper room and you get down and pray no matter what it feels like. Anybody, anybody here ever walked into a service and you knew you were supposed to be praying? You knew you were supposed to be doing something? Huh? And at first, everybody kind of seems a little disorganized. I'm being real, right? Here up in Tennessee, we had a prayer service that we went into. We prayed one night. God moved mightily in the prayer service. But you know, when we first walked in, everybody's kind of, you know, we're looking around at each other and everybody's kind of thinking to themselves, well, we're supposed to be praying. And so eventually, this one goes off to their little place. That one goes off to their little place. Amen. And we weren't all praying at the very same spot. Amen. Uh, Sister Myers wasn't praying right beside me. Uh, Brother Billy wasn't praying right beside me. We we were all in the same room and we all weren't praying the same exact thing. But you know what happened? We came together in one 
common goal. What was the common goal? It was to pray that God would send down revival. You see what we need in the church before God can empower us, before God can show us purpose, and before God can renew our vision. We gotta come together in unity. We gotta come on somebody. We gotta be in one mind and one accord. We gotta be praying for the same thing. Come on somebody, can you say amen? When a church gets together in unity, are you listening closely? I'm gonna use something crazy so y'all laugh and y'all stay in here with me and you won't just walk out on me. huh? When a church gets unified together, I don't care if Betty Sue's making a uh, fruitcake as a fundraiser and every one of us hate fruitcake. If Betty's making fruitcake as a fundraiser and we're all in this thing together, if it's for the sake of the gospel, if it's to help reach souls, if it's to help put shoes on a homeless person, if it's to help the church to pay the bills, Hey Amen. Count me in. I might not eat my piece, but I'm going to be counted in. And I tell you, as a church, we need to bind together, stick together. They had to stick together and pray together in that upper room before the power came down. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that in this day to day, it's all about self. Let me tell you how carnal this day is we're living in. We got piano players jumping from church to church to church because this church will pay them more money to play every Sunday. Huh? How do you know I got friends of mine that we've talked about this? I don't tolerate that kind of stuff. First of all, if I don't get paid, I sure probably, I don't see us paying a piano player. Come on now. Huh? Amen. Amen. What I'm telling you tonight is it's become carnal. Well, I didn't get to sing, and if I didn't get to sing, if I didn't get to lead prayer, if I didn't, if I, if I, if I, if I, the problem is I had us. But John said, I must decrease that he can increase. And you know when you humble yourself and you just join up, yoke together, you, it'll blow your mind what God can do in the upper room. Can you say amen? If we can just get people to make a decision that says, you know what? Hey, I'm not hanging around here in Olivet. If the Spirit of God's moving in Jerusalem, guess where I'm gonna be? I'm gonna be in Jerusalem. I'm gonna find that upper room and wherever the power of God's being poured out, that's where I wanna be. Come on, somebody. I'm telling us here tonight, there ought to be a hunger and a thirst rising up within us. Amen. When you look around, you see the signs of the time. Is there anybody here that would agree with me? You ain't gotta be a rocket scientist to know that we are living in evil times. Amen. I've never seen America so immoral in all of my life. They call wrong right and right wrong. Amen, it's time for the church to bind together. The Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourself so much more as you see this evil day approaching. Folks, the evil day's on us. Amen, we need the fellowship of the saints more today than we've ever needed it. We, we gain strength together, we pray together because that's how God intended it to be. Let me tell you something tonight. I'm, I'm Pentecostal to the core, I really believe I am. <laughs> Huh? But it breaks my heart when Pentecostal people think that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is all about speaking in tongues. I read there in the Bible where he said, you shall receive tongues, right? No. And you shall receive power. Here lately, I've had the devil coming at me from the left, the right, the front, the behind. And I'm going to tell you something. How do you pastor a church like that? How do you pastor under pressure? My wife's at home sick. I'm here. You see, a lot of folks, if little Johnny gets the sniffles, the whole family stays home. My wife's at home sick. Hey, man, can't even hardly get out of the bed. And where am I at? I'm at the house of God reaching for more souls, trying to help people. You know the reason why? Because there's still a gospel to preach. There's still people to reach. I know that lady laying in that bed, if she went home to be with the Lord tonight, uh, she's ready. But I wonder if we are. My oh, God. You see, it's power. It's power to talk right, power to live right, and keep in power. You want me to tell you the thing that blows my mind about God the most? You see, 
If you want to stay in this race, you can. You have to make a conscious decision to go back on God. But there's a lot of folks stuck in all of it. There's a lot of folks stuck right where Christ showed himself mighty. There's a lot of folks that already said, I'll take his blood, I'll take his mercy, and they stayed in all of it. But there's a few more people that said, hey, I can't stay here. There's more. I can't stay in all of it. There's more. It's time to go to the upper room. And you see, when God said, I'll give you power, how many of you tonight says, I fight the devil all the time. And you know what? If you're gonna stay in this race, you better get the Holy Ghost. You better pray till you get baptized because you may not make it. Can you say amen? If you want to make sure that if the Lord should tarry his coming another few years, that you're still in this race and you're not on the prayer list, pray for her, pray for him, because they ain't in this race no more, you need to get down and get in the altar and get filled with the Holy Ghost. Huh? The Holy Ghost was not a suggestion. He said, go and don't leave. He knew what they were going to face. All right, you ready for this? I told you he's going to give them power. He's going to give them purpose. And he's going to give them vision. When he gave them power, that keep and stay in power. Do you know what happened to the early church? We think we're persecuted because somebody said they don't like a dress color we had on or because some crazy junk today. These folks, they got their heads cut off like some of these crazy people in ISIS are cutting people's head off overseas. They got their heads cut off. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist got his head cut off. Some of them got skinned alive. I want you to wrap yourself around something for just a minute, okay? Come here, Brother Steve. Let's just say we're going to skin a man alive. We're going to do him like a fish make an incision, a cut around here. We're going to grab a hold of that skin and we're just going to start pulling it off your body. We're going to cut you right around here and we're going to pull your scalp clean back. Blood running everywhere. We're going to hang you upside down from a cross. We're going to, some of them people that got burned at the stake, they, they put them in a substance kind of like tar. And they said, some of the old martyrs, I don't know if it happened back then, but I know some of the martyrs through times they've done this. One particular I read in the book of Fox's Martyrs. You can go back and read the story yourself. I don't remember the exact story, but I'm going to tell you the way I remember this story. There were some people, they poured tar all over them, and they would set them on fire and let them burn like torches in the night. Huh? And as a group of those people got ready to go to be burned at the stake, they began to talk about amongst themselves about how painful that it might be. I wonder how much we'll suffer. And one of the men said, I'm going to be next. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, if the fire is bearable, if the Lord is there with me, he said, whenever I can't take it much more, he said, I'll, I'll hold up one finger. Well, the story goes, Pastor Smith, they let him out there. They put the tar all over him. They tied him to a stake and set the man on fire while the rest of them stood back knowing their time was fixing to be next. While he sat there and burned for the longest time, he never raised his hand. He never did nothing. He just sat there while his body was on fire. The story said he had been there burning so long that the flesh began to drip off his hands like liquid candles, you know, just dripping off. They said eventually his fingers clean burned almost slap off. He didn't even have no fingers to raise. And they said when they thought that all was lost, all of a sudden, his hand with a nub went up like that. <laughs> in other words, he's in the fire with me. I went, if a man can go that far, and the Lord be with him. You say, man, I, I don't even like to put my hand on a hot stove. What I'm trying to paint a picture of tonight is this. Christ, he sent them to Jerusalem. They had to leave Olivet to get power. Some of them would be crucified.
crucified. Some of them would be skinned alive. Some of them would be burned at the stake. And he said, I'm going to send you to get the Holy Ghost. And that power will keep you through it all. Why is it important, preacher? My God. I've preached this story many times. I'm just going to, I'm briefly going to tell you this. You remember in Luke chapter 4, whenever Jesus went into the wilderness full of power, and he came out full of what? Power. The Bible said he went in full of the Holy Ghost, and he came out full of the Holy Ghost and power. You see, if we're going to win in the wilderness temptation, we too need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But you got to make a decision, honey. You got to get up and start making your way towards all of that. Sometimes you may have to do like Elijah. Whenever Elijah said, Let me go home and kiss mama and daddy, let me kill the cow, burn the plow. Elijah, him and Elisha had to tell Elijah, I'll be right back. He killed the cow, he burned the plow so he could march forward and do the work God called him to do. I'm telling you tonight, there's some decisions in your life that must be made. There's some of you, you're wandering aimlessly through your life. Do you know one of the biggest upsets about humanity is trying to figure out our purpose in life? What am I supposed to be doing? You'll be 25 years old. You've already had 5 to 15 jobs. You can't hold a job. You've already had hundreds of friends who have stabbed you in the back. Already had a jerk for a boyfriend or a husband or you had a, had a cheating wife. You've already been through so many upsets in your life. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? And you're still wondering to yourself, what is my purpose? What am I here for? You see, when he told him to leave Olivet, he was about to launch the church forth into one of the greatest mission fields and to prepare them to do what he called them to do. Your purpose in this life is not to make money, build houses, and drive fancy cars. I know that we got a lot of television preachers today and they've made it all about our prosperity and now we're hearing them get on the televisions. I don't watch it, but we're hearing them get on the televisions and tell people that it's all about us. It's all about us. Let me tell you, it's ain't all about us. Amen, when God called them to go to Jerusalem, he didn't say it's all about you. But you see, whenever he sent them to Jerusalem, and they went in that upper room and they began to tear and pray. The church took on greater purpose. I want you to see the flowing of events tonight and I want you to listen to me. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They messed up. God put them out of the garden. They had broken fellowship with God whereas one time they walked in the cool of the day with him. And so God had to come up with a plan that he could redeem mankind back, that he could redeem that fellowship that he once had. You see, there was even a time whenever in the days of, uh, I believe it was Moses, whenever the people stood afar off while Moses stood for the people and talked to God upon the mountainside because the people were scared to death. But you see, thousands of years later, that plan finally came to fruition and that Christ Messiah came. He's now died. He's bled. He's died. He's rose again. And now he stands before these people by many infallible proofs. And now he says, listen, there's one more thing you need to do. What was he doing, church? He was getting ready to launch the church forth like a rocket you see right after they got filled with the Holy Ghost and they went into the highways and hedges and they began to evangelize this is when you see them winning thousands of souls and in nowhere else will you see in scripture that the church was instituted quite like it was amen throughout the book of Acts they began to establish churches amen in a greater way the apostle Paul became one of the greatest preachers of his day going from church to place to place planting churches Amen. When Paul would leave him in one situation, he got a hold of a young preacher boy by the name of Timothy to come behind him and pastor the church. He started. <laughs> what was he doing, Pastor Myers? They were, they were helping to institute and form the church. I am afraid tonight that we've made church all about 
coming and being entertained. Bless me with a few songs. Bless me with a little bit of preaching. Bless me with a little bit of this and that and the other. Amen. If it ain't my flavor, if it ain't my kind, if it ain't my style, if it ain't, if it ain't, if it ain't. Let me tell you something. I'll, I'll, let me put it to you like this. Let me tell you how silly that is. If right now, if these folks over here in these other countries decided to drop a nuclear bomb or something on America, I promise you, the next church service you come to, we would care less about how somebody sang, whether we got a song in the right key. I'll tell you what it would be about. It would be about people finding their way back to Jerusalem. It would be about people finding their way back to an altar. We would care less about whether or not we had the best choir in town. We would care less whether or not we was the best singer in the church. We'd care less whether or not we could preach good. We'd care less about all the carnal stuff. It doesn't matter. We'd care less whether or not God had put a big deposit in our bank last week. We'd care less about all of that. But I'll tell you what would matter at that time is what should matter right now. And that's our soul salvation. Where do I stand in God right now? And I'm going to close with this thought here. A decision must be made in all of it. Decisions have got to be made. When I first got saved, I, I sang a song, and I had never heard anybody else sing this song but the Pentecostal expressions. And the song goes something like this. I got a brand new experience, the old time way. I don't talk the same talk since Jesus came in it's the way that he showed me while I was still on my knees I found out for myself when the Holy Ghost found me you know what that song the theme of that song was it was my personal testimony Sister Tammy you remember me singing that I was freshly saved and you know what that song became my personal testimony because everything about the life of a child of God is about the change the transition about what God does let me tell you something if you went down to the altar and you prayed God save me and there's been no change no, no spiritual metamorphosis in your life you need to go keep going back down the altar keep praying because what God begins to do he begins to change things in your life he begins to make you a brand new person he begins to change your attitude he begins to change your ways and you know what I had to do church I had to start making decisions I had to start making decisions in my life and I had to say you know what I'm not going to run with that crowd no more I'm not going to talk like that anymore I'm not going to do those things anymore you know why because God called me to change I'm telling you right now that God God has called the church to change. He's called the church to go to Jerusalem, leave all of that behind, stop wallowing in your sin, uh, stop playing in, uh, playing church, uh, and make up your mind tonight that I want to go all the way. I'm tired of living this haphazard way. How many tonight, says uh, Brother Myers, I've been to a lot of churches, and I go in, uh, and you can't tell the church from a nightclub. I've gone into the church, and it says, Dad, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Let me tell you some church it's your job and it's my job to stir up the gift of God that's in us Paul told Timothy he said Timothy stir up the gift of God that's in you you know what that meant that word gift in its original means fire stir up the fire within you I had a pastor one time tell me that he stayed on a vacation with his family. And he said it was the middle of winter. And I think it was Alaska. I don't remember. But he said it was, he said snow was piled up outside the house against the sides of the house and the door and the windows. He said every day we had to go out in the bitter cold and we had to find wood and bring it back to the house. And he said at nighttime, he said somebody was appointed to keep the fire going. Hear me? Because if they didn't, what would happen is that during the night, the fire would go out and the whole cabin that they stayed in would start getting cold and everybody in that cabin would get cold. Are you listening to me? He said that each night 
they took turns. And he said, and when my night came, he said, I remember laying in the bed. And he said, I felt all warm and cozy. He said, if you rolled over close to the wall, he said, you could feel the cool coming off the window where the snow was piled up on the outside of the house. He said, but my toes were warm. My, my body was warm and I was comfortable. And he said, I woke up when I was supposed to wake up. And he said, I thought about it. You know, you know, you need to go down and you need to put some more wood on the fire and you need to stir the coals up. He said, but I was so comfortable. He said, I didn't want to get out of bed. He said, I was afraid that I might get cold and he said I was still half asleep he said so I chose not to get out of bed and I chose not to go stir the fire he said a few hours later he said everybody in the house woke up freezing cold can I tell you that's where the church is today amen we've not got enough preachers and enough people stirring the fire amen that gift of God in us and what's happening is people are freezing to death people are coming into church and they're leaving the same way they came my God, I pray tonight uh, that we could stir up the fire one more time. Get down to the altar and pray. Beat on the altar. Call on God and do whatever it takes because if we don't do it, I want to ask you tonight, who is going to be the one to stir up the gift and the fire? Who's going to get down and pray? Who's going to be eat up with the zeal of the Lord to find somebody and tell them about Christ? And I tell you, sister, Kathy, what God's doing is a gradual change of work inside of you. You'll find yourself the things you used to say. Amen. You'll check your own self. The Holy Ghost will quicken you. And you'll start saying, man, I can't believe I used to talk like that. You'll start saying things like, man, I can't believe that I didn't experience this before. The only regret I have uh, is that I didn't get saved sooner. And I'm asking you to stand all across the house tonight. As you stand tonight, I want to remind you that God's reaching out and he's trying to get a church ready. I don't know when our last service might be. I don't know when my last sermon might be. I don't know whenever our last breath would be drawn. You and I don't know. And I'm telling you, we got folks all around us. This community right here is a drug haven. We got drugs running up and down the street on every side. And I'm telling you tonight, as a pastor, you might point your finger at me and say pastor hey amen you need to motivate us church I'm doing the best I can but it's your job to do what you're supposed to do I was called the pastor and I'm doing what God called me to do I'm asking you tonight are you ready whenever you hear the call and the Lord says hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Raise your hands right now, church. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to obey the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, saints of God. Lift your hand right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, obey the Lord tonight. Don't you sit on God tonight. My God, we need you tonight to help us as your church. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to tell you right now, this is exactly the reason why I preach what I did. Because it's easier to say, I'll go. It's easy for you to say, yeah, I'll, go, I'll leave Olivet and I'll head to Jerusalem. But when the moment comes and God says, I want to use you, too many times, we sit on God. God's using this as an example to prove to some of you what I've said tonight. It's about an eyes of clothes. Don't be a casual Christian. Don't just casually serve God. But make up your mind tonight to go all the way. There's really no reason why you can't. Somebody come to the piano quickly for me. His head's about and eyes are closed. I believe the Lord's dealing with some folks here tonight. You talk a lot about church. And you talk about the good things of God. But you can stay in all of it and talk about God all day long. You can stay in all of it and talk about the good things of God all day long. Would you rather just leave, go to Jerusalem, and experience it? Or are you content to stay right where you're at? 
You see, church, I'm seeing a lot of folks in the church age today. They're content to have nothing. They're content to have a bland, dry, worn out experience. But I don't know about you, but I've come too far tonight to just live with a haphazard experience. Come on, saints of God. I'm challenging you to come to this altar tonight and begin to bury your head and, or stand and pray or do whatever you got to do to get a hold of the hem of the Lord's garment tonight. You see, God's reaching out to folks. He's trying to get their attention. He's trying to help them. Too often we're so busy and wrapped up in all of our own things. We forget the most important thing. Some of them could have said, Lord, I got things to do tomorrow. I don't have time to go to the upper room. I don't have time to go to Jerusalem. Some of them could have got over there to Jerusalem and said, Lord, I prayed two days straight and we didn't receive anything. I've got other things I need to get done right now and they could have left. But history tells us they stood. They stayed there 10 days. God will give you power. He'll give the church purpose. Not only that, but He'll refresh your vision. When you get to the place that you, you forget the call, the commission that God gave the church, He's able to refresh your vision. Maybe bring you back to an earlier time when you were a part of Grace Street. You went around, you put hangers on doors and you knocked on doors and you invited people to church. You talked about building the church and you were concerned about seeing the church grow. And now here lately, you might have to look at yourself. And here lately, Pastor Myers, to be honest with you, the only thing I've been doing is I've just been holding the fort. I haven't been storming the gates. Come on, this is your opportunity to be real with God and the altar. I want to tell you tonight, I don't care how young you are, how old you are. It doesn't matter from where you are. God loves every single last one of you. And God will use you if you put your life on the altar. God will use you. He'll do things to you you didn't think God could do. Lord, I just pray tonight, God, touch our young people, old and alike. God, every one of us, we need the Spirit of the Lord to give us direction tonight. God, help me not get sidetracked with everything going on tonight, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, come on, saints of God, help us pray tonight. <laughs>